Welcome everybody. My name is Jackie Mayo. I'm the class and events coordinator for the city of Austin small business program. You guys are in for a, a good treat. Annalise and Drew are here to give you all the good stuff about owning it. I don't know if anybody watches Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, but that's one of Lisa Renna's things, own it. But now you guys are owning it. Hello, welcome. Today we are here to talk about being a part of a board of directors, what that means, how it works, how it works in a co-op. Um, and I hope that this will be an interactive session. I will ask you all some questions from time to time, so be ready. And I hope you will ask me questions whenever they come up. There's not a strict Q&A period in this session. It's just, it's just here for everyone. Um, so a, a little bit about the overall program that this is a part of. Um, Jackie mentioned that this is part of a series that it's possible to take multiple workshops with you. This is, we call this the Austin Cooperative Coaching and Training Project, and it's part of the City of Austin's Economic Development Department programming. Uh, we have expert trainers and coaches in a variety of different co-op fields. Um, I am from the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. I'm the director of the Texas Rural Cooperative Center. Uh, my office is in Austin, but the rest of my colleagues, including Blanca and Israel, who are here this evening, uh, are down in the Rio Grande Valley in South Texas. Um, the Austin Cooperative Business Association is a really important part of our collaborative. Drew De Los Santos is here from the ACBA, and they are the group that works with the city and with co-ops to build the cooperative ecosystem here in Austin. Uh, they've really done incredible work over the last decade to make Austin a great city for co-ops. And then the other part of our collaborative who isn't with us this evening is Nil Consulting, that's Ryan Nil, who's an expert on housing cooperatives in particular and does classes as well as coaching on cooperative housing. Uh, so that's the team and uh, we come together each month to bring Austinites a new workshop on some aspect of cooperative business. Like Jackie was saying, if you have attended some of these courses or if this is your first course, but you're interested in that certificate, uh, the, the way it works is you come to five different co-op training classes um, there's no real time limit to how you can take as long as you need to. You could take years to do it. You could take five months to do it. Um, come to those classes. We keep track of your attendance. And once you've attended five different ones, then you get your certificate. Please invite anybody who you're interested in starting a co-op with to come and so that y'all can share that information together, have the same like a foundation to work from on your project um, and just so that everybody feels included and feels confident in being a part of a co-op. Okay, so the uh, objectives of our training today to understand the role of a board of directors in a cooperative and to identify specific action items that will go into a board calendar the the sort of cycle and rhythm of board work is something that uh, it's not rocket science, but it's a really helpful tool to just put down on paper a plan for the work that you want to do over the course of the year. It's kind of amazing, and this will come up again and again in this session. It's amazing how when a board meets just monthly, how much you forget between those meetings. And so having a really clear board calendar can help to uh, to address some of the like the reacclimation that has to happen at the beginning of each board meeting where everyone kind of wanders in and says, who are what are we doing here? What did we decide last time? 
uh, and then we'll gain some practical skills that will enhance your bird service. Basics first, just a reminder, um, a co-op is a business that's created by a group of people to meet a shared need. So these are three key features of a co-op. So co-ops are businesses. That means most co-ops provide a good or a service to the members or to the public at large. There's some exchange of value that happens as part of a cooperative. It has shared ownership and ownership might be traditional ownership uh, where people have the legal responsibility to make decisions for the business and the right to take profit from the business. It might be more of a, uh, a de facto ownership, for example, a nonprofit that has really strong stakeholder decision making uh, elements can be a type of cooperative. And co-ops operate according to a set of principles. A co-op isn't just a club. It's a business that operates based on the cooperative principles that have been developed by the International Cooperative Alliance and also according to the principles of its owners. And so there are some principles that are sort of spelled out by this international co-op body, but then every co-op has the opportunity to spend some time thinking about what really matters to you as co-op owners and what you want to bring forth into the community by having this co-op. We'll talk about the international co-op principles a little more in a minute. Uh, okay, so what do co-op owners do? Like what's the action of being in a co-op? Co-op owners invest in the business. There's usually money and sometimes also time that's invested in the business in order to become an owner. Owners engage in decision making. So you vote for the board of directors. You vote on changes to the, the bylaws or the core purpose of the co-op. And depending on what type of co-op you have and how many members, there may be other types of decisions that the members all come together to consider. Uh, and then you participate in the co-op. So co-ops happen because they're needed. A co-op isn't like a club where you're coming together to do something uh, that, whoops, that, um, well, clubs are also often very necessary. I got lost in my own sentence. But cooperatives are there to meet a shared need. And so you participate in your cooperative because you need it to exist for some reason. It, there are lots of kinds of businesses that can be owned by a group. So you could have uh, an LLC that's owned by a group, or you could have a, sh a shareholder, like a publicly traded corporation that's owned by hundreds of people. A co-op is also a business owned by a group, but the real key difference is that the co-op exists because the members need it to exist. They want to participate in the business, not just extract cash from the business, but they want the business to exist and uh, be resilient and continue to do whatever it is that business does. I'm being vague about what the business does because co-ops can exist in almost any industry. Um, there are co-ops that serve a wide variety of missions, right? There are farmer-owned co-ops that exist to provide fresh food and a fair living for farmers. There are worker-owned co-ops that exist to create a fair, safe space for workers to do their job. There are housing co-ops that exist to provide affordable housing and uh an opportunity to build community among residents. Co-ops can exist for almost any reason in almost any industry. Uh, the key there is that shared need. And, and that need can often be expressed in a statement of mission. Defining that statement is the first thing I want to talk about that a board of directors does. 
a board creates the statement of mission. A board spends time sitting around and talking about, you know, what is it that we do? What is our unique impact that we are bringing to our community and to our fellow co-op members? And so this is the where I'll, I'll uh, open up my first question to you. If you, I know a couple of you are in the process of starting cooperatives or work with co-ops, and a few of you might be engaged with uh, <clears throat> nonprofits or other businesses with mission statements. Does anybody want to give us an example of a mission statement um, or take a stab at kind of creating one? on the fly. Why does your thing exist? Why does this entity exist? What purpose does it serve? I can share the college houses one, but it's kind of long. Do it. Okay. The College Houses Inc. is a nonprofit educational corporation governed by its members, which has its as its primary purposes, A, maintaining an environment and activities conducive to formal and informal education or self-discovery and exposure to various value systems, academic learning, and experience with management and food operations provide opportunity for educational and personal growth. B, operating by the cooperative method of organization, applying democratic principles to economic and political activity, and reaping the benefits of self-control, shared costs, and respect for the rights of others. C, maintaining sound physical and financial structures to perpetuate the organization. D, provide affordable housing to students. And E, sharing the responsibility for managing the housing between members and staff. Thank you so much, Memo. Uh, can you, for the folks here that aren't familiar with College Houses, can you give us just a very brief uh, description of what kind of co-op College Houses is or co-ops College uh, Houses are? So our co-ops are a little unique uh, to the rest of the country. Uh, for the most part, we house, uh, or our houses hold up to about 130 members. Uh, the smallest one, I believe, is 30, um, which is more normal. But the other houses, we have one that is 76, one's 130, another one's 150. Um, they're very large co-ops. Um, so like, I guess kind of to reiterate the, the business kind of thing, we have officers and we get scholarships because we do a lot of work. Um, I'm also one of the food buyers and I spend at least like 15, 20 hours a week like buying that much food. But yes, we're just very big co-ops. Thanks. And and your members are all students at the University of Texas? Uh, they have to be at an accredited local institution. So St. Edward's ACC UT. Great. And it's a and college houses are housing co-ops. How many different houses do y'all have? I'm sorry if you already said that. Very good. We have seven. Seven. That's really cool thank you so much so okay that's a great example of a mission statement that really uh one of the challenges that a co-op like college houses has is turnover their members are students who may only be there for a year or maximum maybe five years like at the outside and so their mission statement really has to express a lot of specificity. They have to be able to say to the members, like, we're about all of these things. Um, anybody else have a mission statement or a draft of a mission statement that you want to share? I could share Wheatsville's. Go for it. So, and I am an owner, a consumer owner at Wheatsville. Um, the mission of Wheatsville Co-op is to serve a broad range of people by providing them goods and services using efficient methods that avoid manipulation of the consumers and minimize exploitation of the producers or damage to the environment. The primary focus for this mission is supplying high quality food and non doctrinaire information about food to the people of Austin, Texas. Um, something that I find really uh, delightful about Wheatsville and the way they use their mission statement is uh, whenever I've attended a Wheatsville board meeting, 
the board says the mission statement in unison at the beginning of their meeting, or at least they did the last time I was at a meeting, uh, to really make sure that every time they come together, they're, they're keeping that mission top of mind. They're really making sure that a, a really strong part of their board culture is reiterating that mission. Um, I think we have time for one more. Does anybody else have one to share? Drew, what's the uh, mm, the ACBA mission statement? I, I, that's a good question. I believe it's just to build and expand the Central Texas co-op economy. I think that, so yeah, I think that's, that's a very exactly short right. and sweet mm -hmm. <laughs> mission. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I I wanted to highlight that one because it is so uh, succinct and yet leaves room for a lot of different kinds of activities. Uh, so re thinking about a mission statement and reviewing it, it is a key activity that a board of directors engages in, maybe not every year, but every two to three years. And certainly, uh, as you're forming a board, if you're bringing on new board members, if you're onboarding new board members to an existing board, really making sure that everyone who's coming into the organization as a leader knows and understands that mission statement is a really important part of board work. So governance is, is what we're talking about when we talk about the work of a board. Uh, especially for new cooperatives, it is so typical that you will have one group of maybe five to seven people who are doing everything, the the day-to-day -day work, the operations work, if there is any, figuring out a business plan, uh, trying to find customers, designing uh products, if there are going to be products, making guesses about how much inventory you'll need, all, all of those things that happen in a business. Uh, as you're founding that business, it's going to be all hands on deck. Governance specifically is the time that you take, whether you're a single owner of a business or a group of owners, the time that you take and the structure that you build to hold how that business is going to work. So it's the structure, it's rules, it's bylaws, it's policies, it's how you talk to each other, it's how you make decisions, it's how you decide whether you're doing a good job. That's really governance. And the board, for the most part, in a cooperative, the board holds the responsibility for governance, for, for making sure that the co-op has a mission and has some structures in place so that it can move towards its mission. All right, let's talk a little bit about the co-op values. I am going to let them scroll by so you can gaze at these beautiful posters, which just as a side note are for sale from, uh, from ACBA, <laughs> uh, which I mentioned because I have one behind me. Um, sometimes we have big parties and give these away for free as door prizes. They're cool. We should make postcards, Drew. I know that that is sort of off topic, but that's my merchandising. That's, cool. <laughs> that's my merchandising idea for the day. Uh, so these are the seven cooperative principles that were articulated by the, uh, the International Cooperative Alliance. And they're actually being reviewed even as we speak. These principles exclude some really important things. They talk a lot about democracy and autonomy and caring for your community. They don't say anything about equity, at least not explicitly. And they don't say anything about worker rights explicitly. Some people argue that that's in there sort of baked in uh, implicitly, but I, 
the newer version of these is going to have much more explicit language around being fair and being equitable and caring for people who are in who are workers i think that's a a really interesting piece of the cooperative movement where you have worker owned cooperatives on the one hand that are owned by workers and therefore center worker concerns and worker rights but consumer owned co-ops or housing co-ops don't necessarily because their owners came together for a different need they came together not because they needed a fair safe workplace but because they needed products or services or products and services at a certain price point and so there are there are some times when the needs of the co-op members and the needs of the workers at the co-op might be there might be some tension there and being open about that and and making it a part of the fabric of the co-op making a commitment to fair resolution of those of those very natural conflict dynamics is really important so we've touched on this a little bit uh there are many types of housing co-ops or sorry there are many types of co-ops housing co-ops are are one type where people live together purchasing co-ops so you might buy something together uh for example a buying club if you're i've got a friend who buys huge like five gallon jugs of um, maple syrup from this maple farm up in maine and uh and she always gets a group of people together to buy that maple syrup together because she doesn't need 10 gallons of maple syrup, but she wants the good stuff and she wants it cheap in as little packaging as possible. And so we share we share the maple syrup. Uh, credit unions are another type of cooperative. It's, it's member-owned banking. Then we've got worker-owned cooperatives. And... Uh, also marketing cooperatives where you're selling a product together. So that could be uh, farmers coming together to sell what they've grown under a shared brand, or it could be artisans coming together to share something that they've made, or people who provide a service coming together. Typically in a marketing cooperative, the the co-op members aren't employees of the cooperative they're independent makers or producers of something and they want to just market that thing in a shared way the new orleans food co-op by the way is uh really beautiful and if you've been to wheatsville and then you go to the new orleans food co-op you will notice a couple of things uh that they have in common they all have they both use the uh the national co-op grocers branded uh bags and signs so uh there's this big very specific green color and font that happens on the signs inside uh it's just a funny feeling to feel like things look familiar even though you're in a co-op in a different city that the national co-op grocers is a co-op of co-ops. So why do people form cooperatives? We've talked about this a good bit already. You do it to create something that you and your community need. You're doing it to fill a shared need. And, you know, your community is going to define that need. And you're also going to be responsible for figuring out how to meet that need in a way that that continues to be relevant uh, and energize the community to participate. Uh, so I've got another question for the group. For those of you that are thinking about or working on a co-op idea or might be a member of a co-op, uh, what is the shared need that your co-op is, is working to meet? I'll go. Um, hi, I'm Susan, and I think we're um, really 
around creating high quality jobs that um, embrace sort of like the whole person and don't view its employees just as cogs to make profit. So I think really creating high quality jobs, especially in an industry that typically is um, a lower paying job or considered sort of low wage work. And I know your industry, Susan, but will you give a quick a quick summary for the for the rest of the group? Uh, sure. Um, we're working to start a worker owned co-op of um, sewing machine operators. Um, so those with industrial sewing skills. Um, we're very uh, early in the stage, so I think that's the that's as far as we've gotten. <laughs> yeah, it it's it's really it's a really cool project, and Susan is. Uh, Though I know it feels like early stages, Susan is actually rocketing forward at lightning speed. So thanks. Thanks, Susan. Oh, thank uh, you. It was good to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> um, anybody else uh, want to share the need that your co-op is meeting, whether it's a co-op you're creating or a co-op that you happen to be a member of? I'm a longtime member of uh, uh, the University Federal Credit Union. My mom worked for the university when I was a kid. And so uh, I ended up with like a kid account even, even then. And, uh, and so that co-op, at least when it was first started, existed to create a a banking opportunity that uh, was available to students at the university and faculty at the University of Texas and that invested, made local investments to, to better the community. Anybody else wanna share a need that's, that's being met by your co-op? Another one uh, that comes to mind is uh, uh, La Reunion. It's a housing co-op here in Austin that uh, that's not it's not made up of students, but it's an intergenerational housing co-op. It's people post university who have chosen to live in a cooperative and. And the need they're meeting is, of course, the need that I think we all see growing in Austin, the need for affordable housing and not, a, yeah, affordable housing really at any, at any scale, housing that is in some sort of reasonable proportion to people's income. Yeah, I'm also a member of a housing co-op right now. I keep sometimes I forget it because I guess it's become more natural again. But it's not only like affordable housing, but also access to food. Like we share pantry food, so that's a need. And then help with projects, which is like a community, like a need for help in community, um, giving each other rights to airport. So it feels like a bunch of different needs that just happen to be contained in a housing co-op. Just wanted to add to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was reading some uh, meme online earlier this week, and it was somebody talking about how uh, about mutual aid societies and about how what they really want out of a mutual aid society is that when they go to the grocery store and see that there's like a certain fruit on special that they can buy that fruit, even if they don't like it, knowing that somebody in their community will be happy to receive it. And I, I think housing co-ops, especially with that shared food aspect and communal spaces, they feel like meeting that sort of society, family unit kind of need. 
uh, okay, the building blocks of a successful co-op. And these building blocks are really in the hands of the board of directors. The board is, is in many ways responsible for setting the tone, building the culture, and creating strong avenues for these things to happen. So one of them is member engagement. That really means, do your members know that you exist? Do they remember you? Do they care? And do they show up? Um, and then strong governance. That's We talked about that a little earlier. That's building those structures so that people know how to participate in the co-op. Um, and strategic business planning. You work together with the operations team, or if you are the operations team, you bring both sides of your brain together to work on strategic business planning, and then knowing when to ask for help. And by help, I mean find either professionals or advisors to teach you what you don't know or do what you don't know how to do for you. You don't have to learn how to do everything when you're part of a co-op, uh, but you do need to know where to get everything. This is a long list with a lot of little words. Uh, the overall message here is the board's job is to manage the affairs of the business. Managing the affairs of the business that's the legal terminology. It's like in every, in the law of nonprofits, in the law of co-ops, where, where a board of directors is defined, this is its job. And that's because the board stands in the shoes of an owner. So, uh, you know, if you're, it's, it's a little easier to conceive of, at least for me, uh, when I imagine the sorts of decisions that an individual owner makes. You make decisions that are going to impact how many employees you have and how much you're able to pay them. You think about whether there's enough money coming in and going out. You decide what lines of business are going to exist. You might receive input from your from workers or from other parts of the business, but you as the owner are going to make those kinds of decisions. And that's that's the function that a board is also has in relationship to a co-op. You're whether you're a cooperative with five members or you're a cooperative with 2,000 members, you're going to have a board of directors that that's thinking like an owner and making ownership decisions. Um, you're also going to make sure that the co-op is acting legally. You're going to make sure that the board of directors perpetuates itself. And in that way, there's a little bit of a difference, right? That a a sole owner of a business doesn't have as much turnover as the board of directors typically does. Typically on a board of directors, you'll have five to nine board members and they'll serve terms of two to three years. Some boards only have one year terms. It's hard to learn your job in just one year, especially if you're only meeting monthly. So, uh, a three-year term is is what's most typical for co-ops, uh, but that's still a lot of turnover. So you always have to be recruiting new board members. Um, let's pause here for questions. Anything, anything that you're wondering, any specific thing that you've done as a board member, or that you've you've known other board members to do or that you think a board member ought to do that's not on the list? Anything we should talk about here? This might be um, coming up in, in next month's webinar, but um, as it pertains to like worker-owned co-ops, I'd be interested to learn more about what that relationship is between the workers and the board, since I think 
the staff would be a little bit more involved or integrated into the business operations. Yeah, that's a great point. So let me see if this is the slide that sticks. No. Oh, well, this will this speaks to that point as well. So yeah, typically what we say is that the board's job is to do all those things on the previous page and not engage in day to day management of the organization. But your point is absolutely right, Susan, if if it's a worker owned co op, then of course, the people on the board are also going to be deeply engaged in the day to day management of the organization because they're the workers. It's their job. Uh, it's really a uh, it's an exercise in remembering which what task you're doing at a given time. So the board meetings and when you're in that governance role, you're sort of taking a step back from problem solving and like putting out fires in the day to day to try to have the sort of uh, 10,000 foot view of what's going on at the business and to connect, connect some of the pieces where when everybody's got their head down and is really trying to just get stuff done, it's a little bit harder to see. You you come up and you think like, okay, what's our mission? Are we meeting our mission? Uh, what are our goals around member engagement? Is that happening? And sort of, you're just thinking about different questions. So it is the same people with that same deep knowledge that they have of their own role at the business trying to bring that deep knowledge in a way that still allows the whole group to have that that bigger picture view and it is i will not pretend that's easy to do that in fact one of the roles that that drew and blanca and i as as co-op advisors and and coaches one of the roles we can play is facilitating board meetings especially early on to just gently but firmly remind the group when you're drifting into operations discussions, right? Because that's that tends to be more fun, more tangible, and feel more immediate, right? Yeah, if there's an if you're a bakery and there's an order of like seven thousand cakes that has to go out tomorrow, hello guest. Um, if there's an order of 7,000 cakes that has to go out tomorrow, but you're sitting in a board meeting and somebody's like, oh no, I forgot to, I forgot to mix the blue frosting. Like you, everybody wants to turn to that because it's very tangible and it it's very immediate. And so part of the job of a facilitator at the board meetings is to say, you are so right that blue frosting is going to have to wait for another 45 minutes because right now we got to take the 10,000 foot view. So it's hard, but it's doable. The board sets up the structure, hires the people, identifies the goal. The board should try to keep the details of how all of the stuff happens out of the board meetings. For example, uh, the board, we'll go back to our bakery. So the board of directors decides that you're going to, you've been offering only cookies and cakes. The board of directors decides you're also going to offer uh, some bars, some delicious lemon bars that are going to be sold to schools. It's this exclusive contract. And the and the board has decided, yes, we're going to take this. We're going to go in this direction. The board would not then spend their time figuring out how many ingredients to buy and how much money it was going to cost in the board meeting. Instead, the board would say, all right, uh, Drew, you're the head of the bars for schools project so go figure out what we need to do for the bars for schools project if there's 
if you don't have enough room in the budget or you think there's going to be some problem that needs high level attention, bring it back to the board. Otherwise, just do your job and tell us how it goes. So you try to keep those details, those how details out of the boardroom as much as you can. Again, even if it's the same people who are doing the work. Um, I'm coming back, Lynn, to your question. Uh, do the board members need to be members of the co-op? Such a good question. The answer is it depends on what state you're in. So different states have different co-op laws, and some states have multiple co-op laws. Uh, Texas only has one, and Texas does require that the board members be members of the co-op. Now, it's certainly possible for you to have an advisory board that includes people who aren't members of the co-op, but they don't have any decision-making power for like for what the co-op's actually going to do. Um, it is also sometimes possible to create a special member role. And uh, I'll give an example of how this would work. So there, there is a type of co-op that we're working on with the Democracy at Work Institute called a rapid response cooperative. And the rapid response cooperative model is like a staffing agency for, uh, for people who have a hard time accessing traditional employment. So instead of being a temp that's employed by a temp agency, they're owners, they're co-owners of the co-op, but they get staffed on assignments sort of like they would at a temp agency. Uh, I know that's sort of a hazy description, but that's, <laughs> I don't want to get too far into the weeds on it. Uh, but this is all, this is set up with the support of the Democracy at Work Institute and with a cooperative development center like the Rural Cooperative Center. And during the first two years that that co-op exists, they have their, their worker members, and then they have this special member who invests in the co-op financially and doesn't have a voting right, but is technically on the board and is, is basically uh, one of these cooperative development centers sends a person who's a member and goes to all the board meetings and helps advise and helps build decision-making processes, help set up the government system, governance system, um, and also does a lot of the legal legwork, like files the articles of incorporation and uh, helps to write and finalize the bylaws so that there's a, a real, uh, an expert on cooperative development who's a part of the co-op at the beginning. And then at a certain point, that role phases out. Um, Annalise? Yes. I was just gonna ask, so is that something that uh, you would outline in the bylaws? Like, you know, this person, this type of member is uh, on the board for two years and then- Exactly, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. exactly. You would write that into your bylaws. So into, you know, a level of foundational document that's that's core to the way that the business functions and that explains like there's this special thing that we do. This person really is a member, but they have very specific rights and responsibilities. And you can do that, you know, it doesn't have to just look like that special member option. You could have a variety of different types of membership. If there are specific people that you really need on your board, who aren't, for example, aren't ever going to work for your worker-owned co-op, you can build a place for them. The key is to define what that place is and make it super clear what their rights and responsibilities are so that when it comes time to vote or take home a, a share of the profits, there's not, nobody's surprised and disappointed about what, what rights they have. 
All right, so the board, the board's work is all about balancing. You're balancing that need to make the blue frosting with the need to uh, discuss the contract with the school district. One of them is a board thing, new contracts, new lines of business. One of them is an operations thing, still super important, but not the work of the board. Um, another way to think about the co-op's roles and or the board's roles and responsibilities, it's oversight. You're overseeing, you're checking in, you're like doing a spot test, you're getting a report about something, you're asking the questions, are these things happening? You're looking at uh, the results of surveys or um, data that's been gathered about what's happening uh, in order to figure out whether these things are working. That means at the beginning, you're also building the processes by which you can measure these things. You're deciding, okay, we'll know that we're successful at management when uh, we've gotten 17 positive survey results from workers who are being managed, or we'll know we're successful at legal because we're not being uh, we're not receiving fines from a regulatory agency. Whatever the measure is, figure it out, write it down, and then measure it at least once a year. And then the then that whoever at your co-op is in the general manager or CEO role, sometimes it's a management team, that role is to manage. You're managing the staff, you're enacting the policies, you're doing the programs or making sure that you're they're being done. And then you are also making sure that those measuring tools that the board has developed are being used and brought back to the board. You're you're the liaison, you're the one or the team that's going between operations land and board land. And again, with the worker-owned co-op, that that just means you're wearing different hats at different times. I'm just going to add real quick, like at Key Figures, which is a worker-owned co-op, um, the the general manager, the operations manager, uh, is not allowed to run for the board because they directly report to the board. So that's one of those mechanisms that keeps that separated. Yeah, great point. And a, a Black Star is another good example. So Black Star Co-op, it's a consumer-owned brew pub here in Austin. So they have a board made up of nine mostly consumer owners, but they're also democratically managed by a collective of workers. And that collective of workers uh, elects a person to be the board liaison. And so that person also attends the board meeting and communicates with the board of directors, speaking with the voice of the worker owners. Some things the board and the operation side do together, strategic planning, fundraising planning, and then that monitoring and evaluation that we talked about before, the measuring of what, how things are going. Uh, you do strategic planning and fundraising planning together because you just you need both sides in order to get that done. You need to know the vision that the board wants to set, but you also need you need that vision to be grounded in the reality of what actually is happening in the business and what's actually possible. So the rule of thumb for the board you need your nose in the business. You got to be nosy. You got to know what's going on, but you don't. You don't reach in and fix it. To the the biggest thing, the biggest fix that a board really can do, like the most sort of dramatic, drastic, active fix that a board can do, is to replace the manager. If, they, if the board really determines like things are going wrong, this is not the right direction, you, you give the manager new direction. If the manager or the team of managers isn't able to 
move, take that direction and move the co-op in the way that the board wants it to go, then you find a new person to do that work. When I say it like that, it sounds like it might be fast or straightforward. It, of course, is neither of those things. It always takes longer than you wish it had once it's done. But it's something that boards, of course, want to approach very carefully because you don't want to you don't want to tell someone their time with your co-op is done unless you're sure it has to be that way. And that's really normal. And we that's something that we as coaches don't really have a solution for. We're there to support you and to help you make sure that you're documenting everything in the way you need to and that that you're thinking about the the governance pieces and the, the strategy pieces. But at a certain point, you just have to evaluate, you know, is this working or is it not? Uh, this is another big one. The board speaks with one voice. Individual board members do not have the authority of the ownership over any part of the business. It's only the board as a whole, as a as a team that has that power. That's why the board needs a decision making process so that it can know what to say with the one voice that it's using to speak. So the board will vote on things. Uh, the board will make recommendations after discussing it as a collective. The board may sometimes need to meet all alone without members of the operations team present to make sure that they're able to speak with one voice. If they're talking about a very contentious issue and some members of the board want to uh, uh, close the business down and some members of the board want to keep the business open, you probably want that conversation to be behind closed doors so that there's not a lingering memory in the co-op at large about which members of the board wanted to do which thing. Instead, what the co-op needs to know is the co-op is going to stay open because that's what the board as a collective decided. Uh, co-op accountability is circular. So the role of the board, it's not a triangle like a pyramid where the board is at the top and then everyone's underneath them. Uh, because a co-op is is owned by a group of people for their own benefit and governed by that group of people, it's a circle. You've got your board of directors that are accountable to the owners at large who elect them. And then you've got your owners who might be workers, as in this example. You've got your owners who are accountable to each other for participating. Uh, you've got workers who are accountable to managers and managers who are accountable back to the board. It's a big circle. Um, and, and again, if you're a sm small worker-owned co-op, everybody in the co-op might be in every blob of this circle at different times and in different situations. Let's pause for a question. Um, has anyone had an experience serving on a board or uh, um, yeah, being a board member? That's my first question. So uh, just like show of hands, you can raise your hand or use the little hand raisey icon. just memo and me. Uh, okay, then memo, this question is for you and me. Um, what did you like most about being a part of a board? Um, what I like the most is getting to learn about the organization as a whole, um, which I guess is a little bit different from other co-ops because we have several houses. Uh, so there's a lot of different opinions on what should be done about this big maintenance problem. Should it still be deferred? Should we deal with it now? Do we need to take out a loan? And then 
other things like engagement, like what do we do to engage our members? How do we get our members to come to the general member meeting? Um, do we incentivize them? Do we use monetary? Do we, you know, so it's just like trying to hear everyone's opinions across from all seven houses to come to like one, I guess, central um, answer, I would say. Um, so I guess just getting to learn about the other houses and the other people on the board while making those very important decisions. Great. Thank you. Um, I think my, I'll talk about my experience. I was on the board at Black Star Co-op for four years and uh, that was my first experience on a board, at least my first experience where I had any idea what my job was on a board. It was, um, what I really appreciated about it was the chance to understand the realities of the business it, and and change my opinions as a member owner about some things that I had thought were true going in. Uh, for example, when I joined the board, I was really frustrated that the co-op hadn't paid out a patronage share. That's a share of the profits. I really felt like it wasn't living up to its promise to the to the member owners by not making that a priority. And uh, and I would say by the time I left the board, I had first of all a much clearer sense of the incredible financial pressures on food and beverage businesses that that make it really hard to do that. But also a. Uh, a different idea about about uh, whether that should be the primary goal of consumer-owned co-ops, or or even on the in the top five goals for a consumer-owned co-op. So it really changed what I understood about co-ops. It was cool. Um, okay, Memo, what is your least favorite part about serving on a board? Um, I don't know if it's my least favorite part or the hardest part, um, but I guess like getting members to engage in a way to where it's not just me and one other person deciding what to do for like 80 people. Um, sometimes it can be like pulling teeth, like I'm standing up in front of people like, hey, like, what do you want to do? Like, what do you want us to speak on this issue? What are your opinions? Um, so sometimes it does kind of turn into like my least favorite part because I'm just like trying so hard and not getting a lot of engagement from members. Um, so yeah, that would be my answer, I think. Yeah, I would say I would say same. It 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 is a big challenge, especially in a co-op with a lot of members where the members of the board are kind of this, you're kind of on the inside. And you get this different perspective on how everything fits together. And then when you try to share that with the rest of the co-op, I mean, they're just not focused on it. They're not very interested. It's hard to make it exciting. And it's really hard to find this balance where you're, you're making it exciting enough so that you're actually being transparent. Right, because if if you're giving information and nobody's paying attention to it, and then something happens that they don't like, I mean, the first thing that they're going to say is, "You didn't tell us this was coming," and so finding ways to tell people that things are coming uh, that they'll really hear is an ongoing challenge with, I think, any organization of any size. Um, okay, committees really important tool for board work. Committees allow you to get work done um, without having a five-hour board meeting. And that's really kind of the crux of it. You could do the work of committees in the boardroom. It just takes time and you want your board meetings to be um, palatable. You want people to want to come to them and a five-hour meeting is not going to do it. So Typical committees you have are, um, sometimes there's an executive committee. I'm gonna leave that to the side. It, the executive committee is made up of the officers and 
they sometimes act in a sort of CEO role, um, especially if they're if it's early days of the co-op and there isn't a strong CEO or the the manager, excuse me, the manager needs some support with some of the administrative pieces. Uh, the executive committee might do that, or sometimes the executive committee kind of has their own mini meeting to plan what will be at the larger board meeting. That tends to be more the case in like public corporations, shareholder companies, where the president of the board has a lot of power in the company and the other board members are sort of uh uh, they may be more of an honorary position, and so they need things to be like very uh, formally presented to them. Usually, at a at a co op board meeting, you're kind of rolling up your sleeves together in a much more active way. Um, there will typically be a member relations committee, some group of people who's focused on: Are we communicating effectively with our members? What are how are we doing? Um, a finance committee that will be asking the question month after month, how we doing with money? And we'll be sort of translating the data because you get a lot of numbers when you're in a business, right? You get balance sheets and profit and loss and just cash flows and a pile of numbers. So the finance committee can help translate that pile of numbers for the board. Nominating and governance committees are really, really important. You need a committee that's going to make sure that new board members are in the pipeline and then teach those new board members what it means to be on the board. So they'll be teeing up board trainings and finding teachers for those board trainings, organizing the elections for the board, remembering the rules of those elections and the, where they are in the bylaws, all of those really important pieces that everyone has always forgotten by the time the next election rolls around. Uh, you can have committees for other things too. It's not great to have too many committees because then some of them just don't do anything because there are too many committees. A committee needs a charter. If you don't make a charter for your committee, then your committee will immediately forget what it is for and drift. Um, it Your charter doesn't have to look like this, but something that says what the committee's for, who's on the committee, what the committee, how the committee is going to work, and when the committee ends. You can just write it down on a piece of paper as long as you don't lose that piece of paper. Your committees need a charter. There will be disagreements in your co-op. Disagreements are extremely important for the health of the cooperative. If you don't have disagreements, it is usually a sign that one or two people are holding the reins of the business and either not letting other people participate or what's more likely, what's more typical, is that everyone is just leaving it in their competent hands. They're thinking, you know what, Blanca's got it and I don't want to step on her toes. And so I'm just going to, this is great. I like the way things are going. This is fine. I'm not going to disagree, even though that sounds weird to me. So Effective participation requires some facilitation. An outside facilitator can do that, but a board president or board members can also do it in the meeting. You ask questions like, does anyone have a different approach we should consider? So like big open-ended. Um, or if somebody talks too much, you can say, thank you so much for sharing your perspective. It's important to let other community members contribute too. It is okay to call out people who talk too much in a board meeting. In fact, it's pretty important. Um, untenable problems happen. There are You will get stuck on a disagreement and not be able to move forward. And so having someone in the room who can say, let's just try something for now. We're not 
we're not making a permanent decision, but let's try something for now can really be a great way to move things forward. And also pulling people gently but firmly to the center of the conversation if you've got people that tend to sit in the background and just observe. Again, disagreement is healthy. A healthy co-op feels like a family in some ways. Uh, and in order to cultivate a culture where disagreement is okay, you need to take time to get to know each other as people. If you're working together in a worker co-op, it's a little bit easier. You're seeing each other more regularly. You might be having meetings or meals together. But even if you're in a co-op, uh, like the Wheatsville, Wheatsville co-op is a good example. They're the grocery co-op here in Austin. They have owner gatherings periodically. They have events in the grocery stores where they invite owners to come together because if you don't do things together, if you don't know each other, then it doesn't feel like a cooperative. And if it doesn't feel like a cooperative, then it it won't be used or governed or engaged in as as robustly. All right. We're going to talk a bit about the three duties of a board, and these are applicable for any board, and these are legal responsibilities that board members have to their organization. I'm not here to give you legal advice. I'm just giving you the sort of an interpretation of how these things, uh, how these things work. Um, and it's really useful for boards to have a lawyer from time to time come in so that they can pepper them with questions about these duties. Um, it's that's happened on a couple of different uh, different boards that I've been on where like a board member was a lawyer who does this kind of law and they just had a sort of ask me anything session. And that's a great resource. You know, it's it's just great to be able to say, actually, we've been doing this one thing. Is this fine? <laughs> and to have them say, yep, totally fine. Or to have them say, mm, we should talk more. Um, so anyway, I'm not your lawyer. Uh, these are the duties of a board. The duty of loyalty, it means you don't act with a conflict of interest. That's really what it all, what it boils down to. You, it doesn't mean that you can't have a conflict of interest. People in co on co-op boards almost always do, especially if you're in a worker co-op, you know, you're gonna be having discussions about governance that impacts your day-to-day -day work life, like you will have a conflict of interest, but you have to divulge, you have to say, I have a conflict of interest here and either it is going to impact the way I think about this or I shouldn't be involved in this conversation because my conflict of interest is so strong. That's uh, back to what Drew was saying before about key figures and the fact that their manager isn't can't be on the board because their conflict of interest would be so strong so often they want the board to be able to evaluate and criticize and set the salary for the manager and so they need for for that person to not be a member of the board come to your co-ops board meetings without an outside agenda The duty of care tells us that it is okay to be wrong, but it is not okay to be careless, uninformed, or conflicted. So duty of care doesn't mean that you have to be uh, an expert in board work and understand everything about finances in order to make decisions for your co-op. You, you take the degree of skill that an ordinary careful person would have and you look and you see you know are you being careful are you asking questions when you don't understand 
Are you taking the time to review the financial statements regularly? Um, are you asking experts if there's something that's difficult or new? And then you've got the duty of obedience, which sounds very dramatic, but really just means you follow the law. You follow the law of the nation and the state and the city and county where you live. Your bylaws and your articles of incorporation are kind of the laws for the business and they're legally enforceable. And then you'll also have policies that you create. Are you are you doing the stuff that you need to do to be a responsible business member of society? So by fulfilling these duties, in some ways, the board can be protected from liability. Basically what happens is if there's a problem and there's a court involved, the court is going to say, like, all right, well, did did the board do its duties or do we have to reach beyond the board to these individual board members for some reason? And so you're protected if you fulfilled these duties appropriately. The only way to know if these duties have been appropriately fulfilled is if you keep minutes of your board meetings. You have to keep notes of your board meetings. In the current Zoom world, it is pretty common for people to just record their board meetings and maybe also have minutes. Um, I am, once again, not your lawyer, but I am a lawyer. And I did spend my law career reviewing documents of companies that of companies like minutes of their board meetings. And if they had had a recording of their board meeting, then I would have been reviewing the recording of the board meeting. Meaning instead of having two pages of information about what was said, I would have had hours and hours of information about what was said. You may not want everything you say in a board meeting to be legally discoverable. You may not want everything you say at a board meeting to be on the permanent record of your business forever. And that's okay because board meetings should be a safe place to test out ideas, to ask questions, to not know something. And so when you make, when you record those board meetings, you're making it something that is then potentially at least lawyer information and maybe public information. So be careful with that. Um, keep good board minutes. Make sure that when the board makes a decision in a board meeting that you toe the line. If the board decides to uh, to expand your business to include childcare, and you were vehemently against it in the meeting and you think it's gonna be destructive for the business, but the vo board votes to do it, then your messaging to the members is that it's that that's the decision that you're going with. You're, you don't relitigate the board discussions among the membership. And uh, have a board manual to guide your actions. I will say in the interest of complete honesty, None of the boards I work with has a board manual, but there are so many times when it would be helpful. Just have a manual that you can hand to new board members that explains how voting works, that explains uh, how meetings happen, that explains conduct and expectations about when you're gonna respond to an email, all of those sorts of things that are like, what do we owe to each other as board members? Put it in a manual and give it to people and then people can look it up. Or they can ask a question in the board meeting and someone else can look it up for them. Um, there are officers on a board. We are not gonna go into great level of detail about these officer roles, uh, but the, there are required to be officers. That's a legal requirement. And these officers have specific jobs 
that are like written into the law, but the jobs written into the law are pretty basic. The president calls, excuse me, calls board meetings. That's kind of their official job. The vice president is the vice. We all know that job. The secretary takes minutes and knows where the documents are. The treasurer does not, the treasurer is not the bookkeeper for the co-op, though that can sort of be their default role. The treasurer just needs to understand what the financial situation is. If you do have a, a crack finance mind on your board, that's great. Try to encourage them to be the treasurer because it's helpful. And um, most of the time we talked about board terms often being three years. Typically an officer term is just one year. And so when you make a commitment to this sort of larger, more formal role on the board, uh, it's just a one-year commitment. And typically, these board officer positions are elected from within the board. So the members of the co-op just vote for who will be the board members. And then when the board comes together, they make decisions about who will be the officers. Let's talk a wee bit about strategic planning because we get asked about strategic planning a lot. Strategic planning really just means business planning after your first business plan. <laughs> so the first business plan is your business plan. And then when a few years later you come together and you say, does this business plan still make sense? Where are we going now? What's our plan now? That's all strategic planning is. It's just thinking, where are we going to go now? Um, it does not have to be something that takes an incredibly long time. Uh, but it is really useful to gather a lot of data about the current state of the business. And there may be some research that you need to do to know whether the the things that seem like a good idea as the next goal are really a good idea. And so a lot of the strategic planning work, sort of what happens is you come together, you review the current state of the business, you kind of brainstorm where you think you want to go, and then there's some work that has to be done to follow up on those leads, to figure out if they're viable, to figure out if they're really what you want to do. And then you come back together after having some time to do that research work and mulling it over and uh, and talk about it again and make some decisions with that that idea in mind that it's just you're just deciding for right now. Even a strategic plan isn't then set in stone. You're you need something to measure your progress against. You need something to set a focus for the business, but it doesn't have to be set in stone. It's something you can revisit. Um, these are the types of things that a strategic plan might be about. Uh, it's about big direction moves. It's not about little direction moves. So whether to begin offering classes to the community if you are a tea shop, right? Community classes, that's not your core line of work. Uh, investing in a second location, anything to do with real estate is usually part of a strategic plan because those deals tend to take a long time. Uh, prioritizing partnerships with your city or a certain organization or the state. Um, opening a cafe in your bookshop, that would be a big move. It's a strategic decision. Um, hosting a community carnival with a handmade Ferris wheel. Please someone do this so that I can go and ride on it. Um, open a mini golf course. All of these things could be a strategy. Uh, we talked about the process already. It's a it's a collaboration between the the executive director or the CEO or the general manager, whatever your leader person or team is called. It's a collaboration between them and the board. 
and maybe some other key staff members, you know, you got to you got to have the info to make a strategy. OK, the last thing I'll touch on is the need for financial literacy. I'm not going to go through. We're not going to start talking about balance sheets at 730 in the evening, uh, but we do have training around financial literacy and actually there's a CPA who does co-op work out of uh, West Virginia who is gonna be working with us to create some new financial literacy tools and do some like one-on-one -on -one work with some, some of the co-ops that we work with to help build financial literacy. Um, but the basic documents for a board are the budget, a profit and loss statement, which typically functions to show you whether you're doing what the budget thought you would be doing. You're you're looking at the budget versus the actuals when you're looking at the profit and loss. And then the balance sheet that helps you know how much money is in your bank account. Um, there are other important documents like cash flow statements as well. But these are the big ones. And, and the key here is that, like, especially if you're helping to train or bring together a board, just know that if folks are only looking at these documents once a month and they're fairly new to looking at these kinds of documents, they will be overwhelmed every time. They will need a lot of guidance, especially new board members, but also ongoing ones. They will need a lot of guidance to know which numbers to look at and what the numbers are telling them. Um, and so doing some repeated continual trainings, having a strong treasurer who can maybe do an even deeper dive and be a good translator of finances for the group can be incredibly helpful. But again, it's not the board's job to be financial experts, right? It's the board's job to take the care that a reasonably prudent person would take so be careful you don't have to be you don't have to like get an mba just a reminder when you're in your board role when you've got your board hat on that means that you are thinking about the big picture high level strategy of the business you're evaluating performance you're you're thinking about mission you're thinking about strategy you're not thinking about those day-to-day -day management decisions. And the last, the very last thing we'll talk about is the board calendar. These are the things that are on a typical board calendar. And I cannot emphasize enough how helpful it is to just, there are approximately 12 things on this list, and you can just drop one of them into each month on your calendar. Your, the board typically meets 12 times a year in most of the co-ops I work with. Just try to do one at each meeting. Now, that's a little easier said than done because some things like board election actually takes many months to accomplish. So if you put board election in June, somebody needs to start working on it in February. Uh, so, you know, put it on your calendar with some thought behind it and look at it at every meeting so you know what's coming down the pipe. But if you get into a strong practice of using your board calendar, uh, it will really help remind you what your job is. A lot of times when people first join the board, they kind of, they defer entirely to, to management, especially, and to existing board members because they just don't know what their job is. It's not clear what, okay, I'm on the board. I'm giving this gift of my time or you're getting paid for your board time in some cases, but you know, what do you do? You do these things. You review the financials after the financial year ends. You make an annual report. You think through how that previous year went. You uh, review the financials regularly at each board meeting. You get trained on things. You elect new board members. 
you evaluate the management, you evaluate business progress, you evaluate yourselves, you think strategically about the business, you think about the budget for the next year, and then you may have other action items, right? Your committees might say, we need to do a member gathering. So then you've got to plan that. You might decide you're going to make that handmade Ferris wheel. All right, somebody's got to be in charge of that and report back. But this really, it really shapes the work of the board. It's incredibly useful. Um, being on a board is really fun especially if everyone in the board understands what their job is and shows up to the meetings, whether they're virtual in person, shows up ready to focus on the board meeting. So my, my final piece of advice, if you are meeting virtually with a board of directors, is to require, unless there's like a weird extenuating circumstance, but to require that board members be on camera for virtual meetings because it is, uh, I mean, I attend a lot of meetings that I am not on camera for them because I'm doing other things, which is absolutely fine. And generally just the multitasking way that we get, we get to come to things like this and also have our lives. Uh, but for board meetings, it's really important for people to set that other stuff down and be present. And that's what makes it super fun. You know, that's what makes it continue to feel interactive and feel like a cooperative. Um, that's it. That's all I have for you. Any questions? It would be our greatest joy to talk to you more about board work and co-op things. I mean, I we're really excited to see the explosive growth of co-ops in Central Texas over the last several years. And it is actually really, really our job to come and sit with you, sit with your co-op, answer questions, do some research to find answers if we don't know the answer. So just let us know. We would love to be there with you. And I have to say um, this partnership with uh, UTG, uh, UTRGB has been fantastic. Um, I've never worked with such passionate people in a while. Well, and it's <clears throat> and they have taught me about cooperatives because I didn't know anything about them. I just knew I was like, oh my God, I didn't even realize a credit union was a cooperative. See where my brain is? Didn't even know it. Mm -hmm. But you 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 you, you will get the, the best out of all of them. And um and I appreciate them so much for their their passion their diligence, their support. And, um, you know, Gibson, we're going to get that kids cooperative out of you if it's the last thing we do. <coughs> Excuse Absolutely. Me. No, uh, we really appreciate you, Jackie, and working with the city on this. I mean, the fact that <laughs> this conversation is part of a city program and that we get to work with all of you uh, as part of the city of Austin's economic development department is really <laughs> a complete dream come true. I mean, it just feels like we're in exactly the right place working to make the economy of Austin uh, something that works for everyone in Austin. And uh, so thanks for being a part of that this evening. And I can't wait to find out out of all of the people who have attended our, our classes, who's going to be the first the first cooperative to come up. I think yep. it's going to be, I think it's going to be Lynn. She's like on it. I don't know. She's, Susan, Susan's hot on her trail. That we oh, have, that's true. We have a couple, but really honestly, and there are some folks that are doing cool co-op stuff that aren't even coming to our workshops yet. And so there's like, there's a whole other side of this where we do the, the one-on-one -on -one coaching where you may not even have met people, Jackie. So 
Okay. Any any final questions or last thoughts before we? I have one question. Uh, going back to the conversation of the presentation. <laughs> so, uh, I've, I I come from nonprofits, and I do have my experience with nonprofits and board members, and so using that experience for here for co-ops. I know it's different, but I know for nonprofits, if a non if a nonprofit it does goes out of their mission statement or um you know they 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 have that that uh probability of maybe losing their status so what about co-ops what happens or how could a co-op resolve or you know what can they do if they have one of those members who doesn't care who has some kind of conflict of interest or or, or they're at the point where some, you know, something is just totally off in the co-op and the board members are not working. What happens then? Okay, so um, first of all, I'll say a co-op probably wouldn't be in danger of losing any sort of status when you go outside of your mission. So uh, at a nonprofit, you get this special designation from the IRS and you have a specific charitable purpose that you tell the IRS you're going to fulfill. And if you're not fulfilling that, then yeah, they can say like, uh, you're not doing the thing you told us you were going to do to get this special tax status. A co-op doesn't have that special tax status with the IRS. And typically when you do your formation as a co-op, you keep it really broad. You say, we are organizing to do, and these are the literal words, you say, we're organizing to do any legal business activity. <laughs> and you just say that so that if the co-op decides to change course, they're not going to have to go back and change their, their formation documents. Um, it definitely sometimes happens that you have a person who's a part of your board and a part of your membership, who is just not a good cooperator. They are not, it, the, the system of cooperation isn't a good fit for them. They, they don't listen, they don't follow the policies. And, that, and typically the way this manifests is that they are continually frustrated because they are trying to uh, express what they feel is a need for change, and they keep getting met with like procedural stuff. So somebody will come to a board meeting and they'll say, you are doing this the wrong way, and we need to completely change who's on the board of directors, like tonight. And the board of directors says, okay, we hear you, but we have a process for changing who's on the board of directors. And if you really want to do that, this is what you have to do. And that just like, then it just ratchets up. You're never talking about the real issue. You're just getting a ball of fury. Um, what? So there are two lessons there for the board. One is it is really important to have policies and procedures in place so that when someone comes with an issue that's like not on the agenda that you that you have practiced and you are ready to say it's not fair to talk about something that's not on the agenda because the other members don't know we're going to talk about this like we can't we have to use our policies because our policies are what make this work fair. Our policies are what make this transparent for our members. And it can be hard to do that when someone's like demanding change immediately or demanding their way. It is also absolutely fine to determine that someone needs to leave the co-op and to ask them to leave, to give them sort of things things they have to do in order to be allowed to stay or to just vote that they're no longer allowed to be a part of the co-op now it's it's only fine to do that if you have written a process for it in your bylaws so you want to make sure that your bylaws include the option 
for the board to remove a member um, really for any reason. Uh, some co-ops, especially worker-owned co-ops, get nervous about that kind of provision and really want to ensure that that the the full collective is a part of any discussion if somebody's going to like get kicked out of the co-op. Um, I have mixed feelings about that. I think I don't think it's necessarily bad to do it, but it is certainly it certainly makes it take longer and can make it more disruptive for the co-op. But it might be worth it to have that extreme transparency about what the conflict is. So so I think that's a judgment call on your part. Um, I don't know if I quite answered your question, Blanca, but bottom line, you can kick somebody out if you need to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I mean, I have my experiences from the nonprofit and that would also, you know, the boards are different, the bylaws are different, but um, um, I mean, I, I really believe in co-ops and, and uh, but I'm also a realistic person and, and, I, and these conversations are important to talk about, you know, what happens yeah. when it doesn't work out or it's not working out and we, and we want it to succeed, but how do we get it to succeed? Yeah. And I will say it's pretty typical for there to be one person in especially in the startup of a new co-op who who th believes in the idea of the co-op and then really does not like the activity of of engaging with the co-op and feels like it just feels wrong for them and there'll be a very squeaky wheel for a while and then eventually either they'll leave or the board will ask them to leave Thanks, Drew. Something you just said kind of struck me, Annalise, is that if, if you would think someone would know what they're getting into as being part of a co-op, and why would they want to, if they're not fully into it why would they do that I mean I, am I making sense I mean yeah. it just seems kind of weird that you know what it, you know what it is you would think that they would know what they're getting into from the jump yep and 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 I understand the fact that they're once they get into it they may have a change of feeling about it but I, I guess it's just maybe because I'm not of the co-op world and you know i i think where i usually see it is when a co-op is is in that startup phase mm -hmm. and it's you know it's somebody who really sees you know co-ops exist to meet a need right so mm -hmm. it's a person who has that shared need and so they're they're they come into the process thinking okay well i need a place to sell the the carrots that I grow on my farm to to customers. I want to be a part of this co-op that's going to be like more customers for my farm. I need that. And and then the thing that people don't know going into it, right? Because they haven't been to our excellent workshops or or you know just aren't really that familiar with the nuts and bolts of co-ops is you know what what are those moving parts like what does a co-op member actually do it's mm -hmm. different than just showing up and selling and it's also different than having it be your way and really match exactly your vision of how this business is going to be because you're you're in a collective with other people that also have a vision for how it's going to be and so it uh i think it's part of the learning process of mm -hmm. of what is really a co-op by which people determine like oh i get what it is and i thought i would be a person that wanted to do it and it turns out i'm not right gotcha i understand got it 
I think like in terms of the board though, you can always just like elect somebody else if somebody is not like once their term is up, you know, see who else is available or interested in running for the board and, you know, encourage them to run. Um, Awesome. Yeah, I, I think a similar challenge that can happen sometimes on a board is someone who's who's occupying a seat, but not really showing up to things and not really like doing any work. And it's not uncommon to see in the bylaws a provision that allows the board members, if someone hasn't shown up to three mm -hmm. meetings, either allows the board members to vote them off or just says if someone hasn't shown up to three meetings, then they are no longer on the board <laughs> and yeah. like really takes it out of the board's hands so that they don't have to choose to vote their friend or their colleague off the board, but just says like, you know, there may be a lot of good reasons for this, but the board needs people that are showing up. So if you're not showing up, you're not on the board. Right. Got it. I'm been on boards and I've seen that language. So mm -hmm. anybody else have any questions before we close out the evening and give you the last couple of hours of your evening to go do what you need to do? I want to thank you guys for spending a little bit of spending some time with us this evening. Um, really appreciate you and your time. Thank you, Annalise, Blanca, Drew, Maria for being here as well and doing what you guys do best y'all have a good evening have a wonderful night thank you so much for being here